um, 105th commemoration of the Armenian genocide event, which will be in the form of a Zoom discussion and panel. Our title is Armenian Genocide Epidemics and COVID-19. Of course, uh, under the circumstances that the globe is living in, and we are all coming to you from our respective homes or offices. And uh, we will be introducing to you to top-notch experts and speakers who will uh, discuss and educate uh, us on this solemn occasion. Um, we will start with Hachik Muradian, who will talk about the genocide and the epidemics in the context as they interrelate to each other. Um, he will be followed by Dr. Garbis Arboyan, who will uh, lecture about the uh, specific area within the context of the genocide and the epidemics that involved medical experimentations on victims, especially children during the genocide. And then Professor Dr. Yektan Turkilmaz will talk as we get closer to the present day pandemic that we are living in, living during this pandemic and looking backwards the 105 years to the Armenian genocide and provide his reflections. We will then conclude the first part of the speakers with Professor Dr. Kim Hakimian of Columbia University, a public health expert who is in the battlefield, both dealing and interacting, advising, counseling the uh, health ministry in the Republic of Armenia, along with the um, Office of the High Commissioner of the Diaspora, and actually on the field, in the field, in New York City, in the heart of the battle against the coronavirus and globally. I will also introduce to you uh, two co-moderators who will be helping me through this uh, process. And we will then go into the second segment of our program, which will involve a discussion among the panelists, a panel that will also be able to take some questions online from you. And we will be providing those questions to our speakers for their answers. That's in essence our Q&A session. Um, I wanted to just say a few words and before I call on my moderators, um, myself. So as I thought about this, you know, we're sitting here in the middle of a pandemic that at least those who are alive today in our lifetimes and our generations has not seen. And dealing with this change of our lives, it's a drastic change of our lives. But at the same time, when we look back to uh, 105 years ago, there were people, our people, the Armenian people living in their towns and villages across Western Armenia and beyond who had to leave suddenly. Their lives drastically changed. Most of them were killed. And those who survived had to battle the disease, famine, torture, and probably a million times worse than what we have to deal with today. So with that in our minds, um, I start this panel video conference, webinar, you know, whatever we call it, I hope that uh, you will find it educational and informative. And I thank you for your you know, participation. Uh, our first uh, moderator is uh, Dr. Vikan Sefirian, who is a reproductive medicine specialist and the founder and director of Armenian Fertility Specialist Medical Group. He's a double board certified in reproductive endocrinology and infertility as well as obstetrics and gyne gynecology. Dr. Sipilian, as I know him, has been an active member of the Armenian American Medical Society holding multiple leadership positions. He's a past chairman of the organization and he has also served as the chairman of the 11th Armenian Medical World Congress. And at the present time is the president of Armenian Medical International Congress, AMIC a nonprofit organizations with chapters all over the world. 
with the aim of coordinating global efforts in improving healthcare in Armenia. And I know Hamik, through his efforts, has been very actively involved in this battle that we are all waging against COVID-19. He is in constant contact with the you know, health ministry in Armenia, with the Diaspora High Commissioner's Office, and with doctors all over the world, education, each, educating each other, helping each other, assisting each other, and assisting us, those who are you know, their patients. So Dr. Seipilian, you know, welcome. Thank you, Edwin, uh, uh, very much for the kind introduction, um, as well as thank you for the OIA organization under your leadership for bringing us together under these, uh, you know, under these uncertain and troubling circumstances. I'd like to, you know, really um, use one word to describe what we have been going through. And perhaps it's a word that also embodies the history of our people. And that word is resilience. So during these troubling times, um, I have truly been uh, impressed by the resilience that uh, you know, the community various Armenian organizations, uh, the, the government of Armenia, the Ministry of Health, the Office of uh, uh, Diaspora Affairs, the High Commission of Diaspora Affairs has uh, displayed such level of resilience in, in these uh, times of turmoil. And um, which perhaps maybe is something that's genetic, that's left from us for, for uh, centuries, if not millennia. Um, I look forward for the speakers. I look forward for these sessions in health, even though these, this pandemic is a healthcare issue. However, it goes way beyond healthcare. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this, to contribute to this. And I look forward for the, uh, this distinguished panel of speakers as the afternoon goes on. Thank you, Dr. Pillian. Uh, I will now introduce and welcome our other co-moderator. First of all, and foremost, a dear friend of mine. Uh, he is a former chairman of the Armenian Bar Association, currently co-chair of its uh, Armen Armenian Rights Watch Committee. He's a renowned criminal defense attorney. He has uh, been a leader of Armenians in all aspects, uh, but as in today's context, what I recall the most was his leadership as he chaired the committee that organized the 100th anniversary of the Armenian genocide in Los Angeles, uh, the 165,000 person march, and uh, one of our most memorable events as we continue to fight, as we continue our search for eternal justice for the genocide uh, and to get global recognition. He, of course, has he's also been a law professor. Uh, he serves on the Civil Service Commission of the city of Glendale and gives back to his community in all ways he can. Um, I can go on and on and on, but uh, Mr. Gazarian, welcome. We want to hear from you. Uh, Garo, if you can unmute your microphone, please. You are still on mute. Leselie? Ima, hiya. All right. Shabshan agalim, Edwin. Yev iskabes ankam yev sabardim kezmov, yev Dr. Sepilianov. Uh, the two of you, uh, for years and years, have been um, at the forefront. Uh, you, Edwin, uh, from your days as vice chair and then chair of the Armenian Bar Association, uh, and uh, our respective collaborations with Dr. Sepilian uh, through the years uh, while he uh, uh, 
uh, activated uh, and uh, brought the prominence that it deserves to the Armenian American Medical Society and our, uh, and our respective efforts, joint, separate, apart, but always uh, for the same objective, uh, to serve our community, our worldwide Armenian community. Uh, I want to say very briefly that, um, yes, the, the centennial, the Hari Ramyak, as we call it, Shat Hacho Hari Ramyak, the Shet Singh, Hink Arach, 166,000 plus people were on the streets of Los Angeles. Yev Iskabes Mias Nagalutian, Symbole Vorgesen, Menk Ater Tsuits, the Ving Hamay Nashkarin, Yev Menk Mezi, Vor Mer Gusak to Tunere, but Magan Gusak to Tunere, Mer Askain, Gazma Gerbutunere, Yegeretsinere, Mushabutain, Hasta Gutunere, Yedasartats Mutunere, Polora, Mias Napar, Inch Artun Kigernan, Hasnilia has Tsenel, Haitada. Yev Avasik Hink Darinet, as Hamajaragi. Kamama Varagi and Tatskin during this pandemic. Uh, uh, we did it again, uh, we as a community, uh, and we uh, surpassed all expectations. Uh, as you all know, and those of you who may not have known, um, the uh, uh, Los Angeles Armenian Genocide Commemoration Committee, which is made up of all of the uh, Armenian traditional political parties, uh, the churches, the youth organizations, uh, the uh, cultural uh, associations, and the professional associations, including uh, our Armenian Bar Association, the Armenian American Medical Society, the Unified Young Armenians, the Armenian Youth Federation, uh, all of them, all of them coming together. Uh, they thought that uh, we would uh, pay back the, um, uh, the Armenian, the American people who had come to the rescue of 132,000 orphans during the Armenian genocide. And uh, the idea was to raise funds and feed one and a half million uh, needy Americans during this pandemic. Well, they not only met that goal, we not only met that goal as an Armenian community, uh, we surpassed it three times over uh, with over 4.7 million uh, meals uh, secured. Uh, Turkey failed is a hashtag. Uh, never again is a hashtag. Um, uh, but the hashtags that kind of uh, describe and define what it means when we say Turkey failed and never again are hashtags like with our soldiers, hashtags like Artsakh strong, because to have soldiers, you need a nation. And today we have not one, but two. Uh, two uh, governments, the Republic of Artsakh and Republic of Armenia, independent. Um, and um, when we say Artsakh strong, what we mean is what is the meaning behind Turkey failed. And today's program and many programs like this uh, and the communities throughout, throughout the world, not just in uh, Los Angeles or California, but everywhere from the Middle Eastern countries to the European countries to South American countries and North America and Canada and beyond. Uh, of course, with Artsakh and Armenia as the uh, center of our universe, uh, we have shown that Turkey not only failed, that we have succeeded and we will continue to succeed until there is a just reparations and compensation beyond recognition of the Armenian genocide. And I'm simply, Delighted to be uh, with you and with so many others. Uh, if I was to uh, list, I would be talking for hours. So thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Garo. Um, <clears throat> before we move on uh, to our first speaker, I wanted to mention for our audience, some, you know, one of the ground rules is that any questions you have, you can present that and pose it to us either through Q&A or through the chat room. Um, and please feel free to do so throughout the uh, conference and we will do our best to get your questions answered. Uh, also, um, all uh, speakers or all lectures will be in English except for Dr. Harboyan's and Dr. Harboyan will present his uh, lecture in Armenian. But of course, again, at the Q&A, 
uh, any questions in English can be answered by him as well in English language or any language that you prefer. We'll do our best to respond to Armenian questions as well. Um, as we move on, um, I want to you know, introduce with pride our first uh, speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Khachig Muradian. He is uh, a lecturer currently with Columbia University in Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies uh, Department. He has written and spoken extensively about the genocide. He's authored many articles on the genocide, mass violence and unarmed resistance. And um, he's uh, pub published everywhere that you know we've seen him. Um, specifically, he's also the editor of the peer reviewed journal, The Armenian Review, if I'm correct. And um, he has many, many, many accomplishments, but one of them that we, at least at OIA, are very proud of is that he is the first recipient of OIA's Hrant Dink Justice and Freedom Award uh, that we presented to him. We had the honor to present to him in 2014. Uh, Dr. Muradian, it's a pleasure to have you and you know, the forum is yours. Thank you, Edwin, for that introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to shave and put on a suit jacket. Uh, this is uh, indeed uh, in these extraordinary times. Uh, I was asked to uh, allocate the 10 minutes that I have on this panel to speak about the connection between epidemics and the Armenian genocide. And uh, typically when we talk about the Armenian genocide, we, uh, we mention how in the process of deportations, uh, the, the hundreds of thousands of Armenians were exposed to massacres, uh, disease, uh, exposed to the, to the elements, starvation, uh, but, but it's very rare that we focus on a particular uh, case, a particular disease, and the toll it had over uh, the population that was uh, being deported. So uh, what I will do here, uh, as I look at one particular aspect of Ottoman Turkey's uh, dispossession and destruction of the Armenian population, I will be looking at the city of Aleppo specifically, and I will be looking at one specific uh, disease, uh, the typhus epidemic, and the toll it had on the Armenian deportees arriving uh, in what is today Syria. I will do this in order for us to have some uh, better appreciation and understanding of the dynamic on the ground and how, uh, how disease uh, and epidemics uh, played a role in the destruction of the Armenian population and how it was weaponized by the Turkish authorities. Uh, I do this uh, cognizant of the fact that, again, uh, by focusing on one city and on one disease, clearly the bigger picture is not uh, fully being obvious. At the same time, uh, there are benefits to this kind of uh, zooming in because it will allow us to understand and appreciate better, right, uh, the, the immediate environment and of, of, of one particular epidemic and its impact. Uh, so let me set the stage very quickly. Uh, the deportations uh, uh, of Armenians start uh, starting in, uh, in, in April, uh, the, the arrest of intellectuals, which marks April 24th, uh, and uh, are mark you know, the, the beginning of the Armenian genocide. Uh, the first deportees start arriving in, uh, in Syria uh, beginning in early May 1950. And as soon as these first deportees, deportation convoys arrive, uh, particularly from uh, Cilicia, uh, Zaytun and its envir uh, environments, envi environs, uh, several other cities in the region, uh, there is an organized effort by the Aleppo Armenian community uh, the, uh, there was a small Armenian community in the city of Aleppo of around 10,000 people, small but organized. The different Armenian churches, the different Armenian community organizations uh, come together and uh, establish several committees in order to take care of these deportees. Uh, in these earlier stages, uh, as the uh, Ottoman Turkish authorities are coordinating the deportation and massacre of the Armenian population across the empire, 
what's happening in in Syria, where the deportees are supposed to arrive, if or should they survive the deportations and mass march, uh, uh, you know, death marches, uh, is not at the focal point of their attention. Uh, so you have thousands upon thousands of deportees who, beginning in May and increasingly in June, July, and August, start arriving in the region. Now, uh, most of the convoys that arrive, particularly over the summer of 1915, are convoys that are decimated. Uh, you know, most of the men are dead or killed. Uh, you know, most of the, the women and children who are arriving are in destitute and terrible conditions. And uh, it, according to at least one uh, consul, the American consul in Aleppo, uh, the, uh, the, popu the, the first, uh, you know, the, the disease first emerges, you know, uh, typhus first emerges in, in, in the city in this period uh, with the arrival of some 5,000, in his words, terribly emaciated, dirty, ragged, and sick women and children. The only survivors of the thrifty and well-to-do Armenian population of the province of Sivas, end of quote. So, uh, so this is where uh, Jackson attributes the uh, uh, the way you know the spread of the disease and and and how it starts. Now, it's worth noting here that just a few words about uh, a, a typhus epidemic. Uh, typhus is transmitted via a, vac a vector. So you have lice. That is the main means of transmission. Let lice in the clothing and the uh, on the bodies of of, of these deportees, uh, particularly when they are in in close proximity, is the main mode of transmission. Uh, again, it is one of that those diseases that has moved that moves from rodents to humans. And again, uh, there's there's a vector that does this uh, transmission. Uh, under the conditions that the Armenian deportees were exposed to during the entire deportation process itself, as well as the, the environments in which they were forcibly placed, uh, created uh, an atmosphere that made possible this kind of the spread of the disease in, uh, in, in, in, in, a, in a very uh, you know, fast, quick uh, manner. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, within uh, Within just a few weeks, we were uh, Aleppo was in a situation of tremendous uh, pressure. Uh, the disease was spreading among the deportees who were dying in the hundreds, but not only. So there was the population of Aleppo and the villages around it that also were affected by this. And this is important because, uh, again, uh, just like we have seen in many other cases uh, in history and we see today, uh, refugees bear the brunt of sometimes the hatred of uh, the local population because of uh, uh, circumstances that are beyond their control. And this was also the case with the spread of typhus uh, that uh, you, know, uh, you know, many people blamed on the Armenian deportees arriving in Syria. Of course, the Armenians were not, did not just pick up and come to Syria uh, for no reason, they were on uh, on a death march, but that particular detail is lost on the people who are uh, witnessing the arrival of the Armenians. Uh, so this plays an important role as well in the way in which the disease is perceived and the way in which the Ottoman authorities, Ottoman Turkish authorities, will weaponize uh, the, the the epidemic, the typhus epidemic, in order to uh, essentially force Armenians into camps, internment camps, concentration camps, in order for them to die alone, making the case that, you know, leaving them in the city will ultimately uh, lead to more and more locals being infected. So this is just a general context. Uh, it's important to note that, uh, you know, Armenians were not just in this kind of passive situation, in a sense that not doing anything to fight the disease and the genocidal policies uh, themselves. Uh, it is important to note that in this environment where, uh, you know, Armenians, including deportees and the Armenian population in Aleppo, are struggling against the spread of this disease, uh, there are several Armenian doctors who play a tremendous and important role. Uh, two names that come to mind are, are Drs. Khajik Bogosyan and Toros Avajikyan. 
uh, Haji Borosian was uh, was an, uh, on, among the Armenian intellectuals, doctors, leaders who were arrested uh, on April 24 and the weeks that followed in Istanbul, in Constantinople, uh, imprisoned in Ayas Chankara and eventually ends up, is deported, eventually ends up in Aleppo. So you can see how within months, now he is playing a crucial role in assisting deportees and helping deportees who are suffering from uh, from this epidemic. Uh, Toros Ovajikian is another name. Uh, there are several others who are part of this, uh, this effort to assist the deportees as much as possible. At the same time, in September and October 1915, uh, the, the authorities, the Ottoman Turkish authorities in the empire, particularly uh, Jamal Pasha, who is uh, responsible for the region that we are uh, exploring right now, uh, takes a number of stringent measures because he's alerted by the Germans particularly that uh, the spread of typhus, the spread of the epidemic in the region is endangering military supply lines. So uh, suddenly this becomes uh, an issue of military importance. Uh, and getting rid of the Armenians from Syria, from Aleppo in particular, from this urban area, and from these many of these uh, roads uh, where deportation convoys were arriving, becomes a military necessity. And there's an interesting irony here: the fact that originally the Ottoman authorities used military necessity as an excuse to deport and annihilate the Armenian population, and now whoever has survived of these first round of massacres and has arrived in Aleppo is being, uh, once again, these people are being accused, uh, these people are being perceived as uh, a threat by the mere fact that they, you know, the disease is spreading among them and it's a military necessity to push them out. So there's a number of uh, orders that are issued in this period, September, October, 1915, uh, whereby, uh, the, there's a, you know, the Armenians are supposed to be forced out of uh, Aleppo into uh, uh, concentration camps outside of the city. Uh, the plan being that, uh, you know, Armenians are supposed to die alone, right? Uh, this kind of the spread of the disease should be prevented and particularly the, uh, the dangers it poses to the military supply lines should be, uh, should be controlled. So this leads to uh, police officers, the police, gendarmes and others, uh, essentially calming the, calming the city and uh, dragging people from their hiding places, from their homes, from the courtyards of churches in the hundreds, in the thousands, and essentially deporting them to two uh, sites, two uh, uh, detention centers uh, called Sebil and Karlek, right outside the city. And then from there, to uh, El Bab, uh, a nearby town, and then ultimately towards in the direction of Derzor. Uh, the deportation of Armenians towards Derzor and their, ultimately their massacre there in the summer of 1916, uh, you know, is, was already a process that was underway. So Armenians were, as they arrived in Aleppo, gradually were being deported into uh, Ras al Ain, into Derzor, in the general direction along the Euphrates towards, uh, uh, towards Erzor. What happens though is in September, October, 1915, this process is accelerated because the usual process that was taking some time uh, becomes a problem with uh, the disease spreading uh, so much among the population. So this is, uh, this is just to give a quick overview of what is happening to the Armenian population. So what happens is at the same time, the Armenians who had the disease were all rounded up uh, and placed in uh, three locations that were supposed to be hospitals. And, uh, and most of the uh, deportees will identify this place as essentially a place where people went to die, right? Because of the way the disease spreads, you know, there were ox carts that carried the dead, oftentimes without their clothes, their clothes were uh, burned typically in order to get rid of the lice, uh, you know, through the streets of Aleppo into the outskirts of the city and, and, and buried. Uh, 
And these are scenes that you see over and over again described by me in memoirs, uh, described in, in accounts by the, the German Council of Aleppo, the American Council of Aleppo, and many other eyewitnesses. So this becomes uh, a, a tremendous, uh, uh, you know, situation on the ground. Uh, the death of Armenians, apart from the massacres and, uh, and ex you know, exposure and etc., specifically from typhus, continues in the different camps where they are forced, forced to outside of Aleppo, beginning from Sebil and Karlek, all the way into Bab, Mumbuj, and ultimately uh, uh, Rasalain, Meskana, and Derzor. In Meskana alone, it's very likely that close to one-tenth of the entire population that had survived the initial round of massacres and arrived in Syria die in that camp, and a large number of them die of typhus. So suddenly these, these camps where our means are forced into become repositories of, of death. And, uh, and in a way, uh, the, the disease is weaponized by the authorities in order to focus and target the Armenian population and decimate it further. Uh, ultimately, uh, and I'm concluding here, uh, you know, by summer 1916, early summer 1916, many of these camps are going to be shut down and the, and the Armenian deportees are going to be forced again to be marched in the direction of uh, further along the river into Derzor. And there will be horrendous massacres that will take place there leading up to the murder, outright massacre of uh, a couple hundred thousand Armenians who had survived this entire ordeal. Uh, but this is not just a story of destruction and death and murder and massacre and dispossession. This is also a story of resilience. Uh, we see over and over again, and my work, uh, you know, focuses on this, tremendous efforts by Armenian deportees themselves and the Armenian community of Aleppo to organize and support and assist and help those who were sick. Uh, many of whom uh, will die, but uh, others will survive, will recover, and become part of this effort. Uh, there, we do know of, for example, Armenian nurses who end up, uh, you know, uh, you know, getting the disease, uh, recovering from it, uh, securing some kind of immunity, uh, and and ultimately continuing the struggle to help Armenian deportees in this process. So the Armenian genocide, and while we're focusing on, uh, on Syria here, the Armenian genocide is not a story of death and destruction. It is also the story of uh, resisting this process of government-directed uh, uh, annihilation and, and, and massacre. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Khachik, for that uh, very enlightening uh presentation. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll have time after our uh, remaining speakers, and I think we will, uh, because I certainly have a couple of questions. Um, so thank you again. Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Garbis Harboyan. Uh, I uh, looked at uh, Dr. Harboyan's lifelong work, and uh, I'll try and summarize it uh, though I don't know if he'll do justice to the doctor's uh, service to the uh, to the population of different countries throughout the globe and uh, especially to the Armenian communities. Uremen Pajish Garbi Sarboyana, Yir Pajish Kargan Usuma Avardadze, Beiruti Amerigan Hamasarani Mech, Hazarina Batsun Hintalaganin, Hajahadze Beiruti Amerigan Hivantano Tsi. Kit Gogord Kherchakov Aganch Masnakidagan Pajamunka Hazaina Vatsun Hingen Vatsun Inatavagan Nerun. Arikana Hadank, Ravir Vadze Maskaz Melun Nuin Pajan Munkin, Iprev Tasahos Usucic, Minchev Hazaina Rutanasun Hink Tavagana. Pajish Karboyan, Avelikan Yeresun Hink Dariash Hadadze, Iprev Masnaket Yevira Puj, Beiruti Zanazan Hivantanos Nerun Mech. Եվ չերիգի ընդոզին դարածման եւ լսողական խլուտյան միադեղ քոյտյունը congenital corneal dystrophy with progressive sensory sensory neural deafness երեք անցերու մոտ առաջին անգամ լալով համաշխարհային բժշկական քրայանության մեջ հիշատակված է 
Dr. Harboyani Gorme has an area of an asum mectavaganin. Hedakaina Siergu, Ivan Takin, Yerevit Nerumia de Koytuna, Iprev Nor Hamachtanish, Amasharain, Pishkagan Karagan, Tiam Mech, and Van Vaze Harboyan syndrome. Uni Pishkagan, Pasmatibus of Nasiragan, Hot Vazner, Michaskain, Pishkagan Karagan, Tiam Mech. Is ir pejeshkagan ya varok chabagan hayren hot vazner darin erei ver Luis kedesnen spurti haygagan zanazan ora ter teru ye bar pera ter teru match hayren ashkadasirut yun nerun meg masa Luis tesadze aransin hador nerov pejeshkin khosk ver nakrov uremen yergo azarin ye pejeshkin yegrot khosk yergo azar dasne meg yerot khosk yergo azar dasne hing. Եվ բժիշկին 4 խոսքը 2015 ին եւ վերջապես բժիշկին 5-րդ խոսքը 2020 թվականին բժիշկ Կարբիս Հարբոյանը ուրալ գտնված է միշտ իր գործուն մասնակցությունը վերածե ասկային հասարակական կյանքին մեջ ստանձնելով պատասխանադու պաշտոններ այստեղ գուզեմ նշել մի քանիները միայն ժամանակ շատ չխլելու համար Pajiske Radze Mezidan Gilikio Katorigo Sutian and Tanur Jorov Neru, Yev Katorigo Sagan and Ragan Jorovi Adenabet, Lipanani Hayot Stemi Askain Yeres Pohan, Kanadai Hayot Stemi Askain Yeres Pohan, Yev Askain Varsutian Poch Adenabet, Kanakagan Jorovi Evusum Nagan Horuti Adenabet, Hamaskaini Getronagan Varsutian and Tam, Lipanani Shachain Varsutian Adenabet, Canada is a China in Varsutian and Tam, inch best naively Panahai, Pajishkagan, Mutian Korzativ, Varsutian and Tam. Anhra Daragadze, Hachelutian Janabara, Ye Hachelutan and Harutun, Yerguazar das the Hinktavaganin, Ice Hadornera, Hayot Seras Panutian Hairam Yagiaritov, Ye Hai Pajish Nerun, Adam Napush Nerun, Ye Terra Kors Nerun, Voti Sagana, Haigagan Seras Panutian and Tatskin Hadora. Yerguazar das to Utavaganin, in Pesnaev, Hajana Garner, Hagagan Seras Panutenen, Hadora, Yerguazar dasne in him. Dariner Sharna Hai Hasaragagan Yanki, Yev Hatkabes Hamaskain, Zirim Mech, Irdarats Ashadankin, Arikana Hadank, Pajish Garbis Harpoyana, Hamaskaini Shakanashana, Statsadze, Getronagan Varchutiango, me, Yerguazar in the Tavaganin. Na Naev Arjanatsadze, Kanadai Hayots Askain Arash Nortarani, Askain Yegetagan Zarayutsyant, Hov Han Mantaguni Shekanashanin, Yergo Azar Dasti Hingin. Isk San Yergu Hulis Yergo Azar Dasnevetsin, Nabarke Vadar Vadze Naev Jinishyan Sevnargi Beiruti Getroni, the Norenutiangorme, Knahadan Kushadahtagov, Beiruti Horor Tadu Hans Nahum Pimech, Ir Pazma Miazarayutian Amar. Ye Verchabes. Pajish Harboyana, Kisan Vetsumvar, Aistari, Yerguazar Ksanin, Barkeva Dervadze, Naev Norisut, Ozutun Derder, Aramarachin Gatorigo Singome, Gatorigo Sutian Giligian, Aspedish Kanashanov. Habardem, Ser Zarayutian Hamar, Yev Orinageli, Ashadank Darazek, Sireli Doctor, Uremen Ram Metzek. Magalem Yargaro, I will talk. About the pandemics in general that occur during the genocide. I will talk in Armenian, so let me start. Amashkarain Arachin, Baderazmen Arach, Ye Baderazmen Tatskin, Osmanian Bedutian Engerain Kaikamin Hedevankov, Ye Bedutian Arochabagan by Maneru Chikotian by Charov, Inchpesna Bedutian Anhokutian U Ambadrastit Alarum Hedevankov. Zanazan Varagi Chivan to Tuner, Hamajaragi Cebo Vogazen Yegrim Polor Darats Nera, Yev Ampoch Ospanyan Panaga. Ais Varagi Chivan to Tunera, Unetazen Gordanarar, Yev Kantich, Hedevankner, Amengo, Yev Jagovurti Polor Zankbaz Nerum Mech, Hakabes Yegrin, Hai, Huin, Herya, Arab. Եվ ալավի փոքրամասությունները մեջ հայկական ցեղասպանության ընթացքին հայ քաղաքականները եւ հավաքավայրերը գտնված են արաբչոբահական չափազան վատ պայմաններու մեջ եւ հոն փուն դրված են դարբեր դարբեր համաճարակներ 
Hay kahtaganları ays vadarok kahtaganları meç yen targvazen Türk işkanutyan gome timum navor yev zerakırbaz sovi anotutyan yev çırazurgumi. Kahtagan şovurta zergvazen arakçabağan nvazakun baymanların. Anon makarazen aranç emberi çuri yev xsinan tegeni. Avarazen hanamesh yev badardaz vranerudak. Çen unetsaz duynisk naknagan panikneri lvatsaranneri şırçabat bazen cahiçnerov voron bıxtazen cancerov müjegnerov yerzan azan ayl desagi miçatnerov voçlodutyuna yegadze hamadarats ye pnagan yerevut anonk çen bayeleza çen bayelats pejishkagan nvazakun khnank pejishkneri ankdanel yegadzen amengo Voç mektek, e voç mektarman hivatneru barakayın. Anon cagadakiri hasnıvazı astuzo garkatrutyan. Ays hama jalakneri darper darper şırtçanneru meç, irakorza zen irenc kantiç aşkujutyuna hama çayın şırtçanneru yeğanagayın darper utunnerun. Ürakançur şırtçani meç, kerazantza zey boroş hivantotyun ma, or unak, Panaryan, Patsahayt yegazetdak Grimagayen baymanneru meç, Taifısı Tsurt yev Xona baymanneru meç, İzk Bizenterin Ağdot Çurerov ve Oğva Şırçanneru meç, Yev Cahicinerov Şırçabadbaz Bayrenu meç. Hayk Ağtaganneri İrenz Degapoğu Tünneru Untaçkin, Bayelazen Ays Yeğanagayin, Yev Grimayagan Popoğu Tünneru Batçarao, Amen Desagi Hama Jarakner. Ay samajalakneri hıncazen daresnerlu manukneri, mamiknerlu dadikneri aranç xıdurtyan. Anoti uzarav hay kaxtaganneri tarçazen varagirner carriers yev badrast varagelu irens anmichagan harazat çırçabad. Anonk abrazen varanneru mech tizvats unekhats tiakneru het. Zanazan varagi chivan tutunner Hamajaragi çevov xalazen şat çat mes tivov hay kaxtaganerun ye borperun gyanka. Jeshkrit tiver chuning. Sagain harur azaravor hayer mahatsazen ay samajaraknuru untatskin Osmanyan bedutyan sahmanneren ners yev tetus hatkabes Suriya Irak Lipanan Bagestin Hunastan Hayastan yev Ekipdos. Nishanagali tsegazen Tayfoydi, Tayfısı, Gırtnovoğ denti aysin gırıkırıntı fiberi, dizentriyi, malalyayı, kolerayı, zalgahtı, smallpaxı, yev tırakamayı hamacarak nere. Hay kaxtagan joğuburti, sırda cimlik kasut tüneru goğkin, antin, bolsoy, yev Osmanyan bedutyan, Zanazan kağıtları meç, hay pejişkileri, gelakorzları, yev adamla pujları, İrenz Bardatir Zimoragan Zaraytan'ın tatkiyin, Aksura Bayreru, Panderu, Gam İrenz Aşkada Tivan Tanosteru meç, Varakba Zeyn Jandakte. Anosmen Şader'ı Makarele Yet Mahatsu Jandakti Tem, Mahatsa Zeyn, Yemiyatsa Zeyn, Hay Joğuburti Nahadak Pagankin. İm usum nasiri tünneru samatsayın, bol soyev kavarneru meç, jandakte mahatsa zen yotanasun ini pejişk adamna puj yev teğa kord. Çeğaspantyanın tatskin hayeru vra pıdzabor dent aysin kın tayfısi hivan tutyan, şircigi porçaru tünneru masin gırnank hastadel hedevyal maramas tünnere. Tur pejişklerin hınpak mı? Mornalo Pıyışkutyan Hipogradi uxtı, Tayfı Sivantutyan Şicugi Araçin Orinakneri Porçargazen Hayeru vıra. Aranz Kitagan Himnatrumi, Anok Kadarazen Pıyışkagan Porçargutyunner Hay Ivantneru vıra. Anok Aradzen Jandakte Aysinkin Tayfoyde Darabok Ivantnerun Arunu, Yemnerargazen Hay Ivantnerun, Boron Kedakayin Mahatsadzen. 
Tayfası tem batbastan üt ketnelunu batakov. Tur pejişnere himan tanos deru meç. Porçer kadar azen hay zimbor neru vra. Vons meç şadere nuim bes mahats azen. Anon kayere korzac azen. Vor bes porçaragan gentani ner. Yev hay himan neru nerarga zen. Tayfason varakvac arin. Uriş ner. Mahaper batbasti nerargman heraman da bazen. Իրենց կորձգից օսմանսի բիջներուն այս ոջրակորձ թուրք բիջներեն եղած են բահաուդդին շակիր ան դիվ հիվանդության վիջ շիջուգի առաջին օրինակները փորձարկած է հայերու վրա երկրորդ տոֆի սելիմ իր հրամանով բզավոր դիֆի այսինքն թայֆսի թեմ պատվաստանույթ գտնելու նպատակով Երզնգայի գետրոնական իմանտանոցի մեջ փորձեր գդարված են հայ զինվորներու վրա որոնց մեջ շատերը մահացած են աննայ մահապեր պատվաստին երարկման հրաման դվոներեն մեկ եղած է 3-րդ սուլեյման նعمان անմասնակցած է հայերու վրա թայֆս հիվանդության շիջուղի փորձառություններում 4-րդ համդի սուաթ Բազավոր դենթի թայֆսի փորձագությունները հեղինակն է։ Անհայերը կորցած է իբր փորձարական գենտանիներ։ Անհայ հիվանդներուն ներարկած է թայֆսով վարակված արյուն։ Անհայ հիվանդներուն ներարկած է այսպիսի արյուն շատ նկատոններու մեջ։ Այսօր Թուրքիո մեջ Համդի Սուադը գահամարվի տրկական մարեապանոթյան հիմնատիրը եւ անոր նվիրված է բոլսո իշադագի դուն տանկարանը տրկական զինվորական տատավարության ընթացքին թուրք բիջիշներ դոկտոր հայդար քեմալ եւ դոկտոր սալահ սալահդին իրենց վկայությունները դված են սելով որ իրենք անսնավես ագանադես եղած են այս անմարդկային եւ բիջիշկական օրեն անունտունելի արարներուն Դոկտոր Հայդար Քեմալ 23 դեկտեմբեր 1918-ին բացնամա կարաձեկո Թուրքիո ներքին նախարարության սելով հետերյալը Հայոց Սվրակի դագան վայրակություններ գդարված են Երզնգայի մեջ 1915-ի դեկտեմբերին Այդ թվականին Երզնգայի երրորդ բանակի բիջիշկավե Տոֆի Սելիմի հրամանով Բազավոր դիֆե թայֆսե բարակված հիվանդներեն առնված արյունը առանց անկորձանելու այսինքն ինակտիվեթ ընել է առաջ գներարկվեր անմայ հայերու եւ գխապային զանոն որբես դի ներարկվածը թարմանող թեղմն է բայց եւ այնպես անոնք դմահանային այս փորձարկություններեն այս փորձարկությունները բժիշկական օրեն պետք է գդարվեին միան փորձարական գենտանիներու վրա Այս փորձարկությունները գդարողը գդարողը դոկտոր Համիդ Սուհատ տրկական զինվորական բժշկական թերթին մեջ գրած էր թե ինք այս փորձարկությունները գներ սվանվելու տատավարձվածնի վրա այսինքն այն իվանները որոնք տատավարձված էին սվանվելու սակայն ուսե ան ես կվգայեմ որ փորձարկողներու միակ հանցանքը հայ ըլլալ լինն էր Այս փորձարկություններու մոդեն դեղյագեն այդ օրերու երզնգայի գետրոնական հիվանդանոցի բժիշկապետ դոկտոր Ռեֆհատ Բեյ ինչպես նաև երզնգայի գարմիր մահեգի բժիշկապետ դոկտոր Սալահեդին շնորհակալություն Hay. Okay. Şat sesun aragan ek doktor Halboyan. Hima Garoin bir diganchi, but Garo Kazaryan. I can't get on the air. We see. Oh, we can. Can you tell me can to? Because the host has stopped. To hartsum nere aden doktor Halboyan et follow gernakinel and bobe bor hartsum uni gerna chat rumen or Facebooken mezi hartsum nere hergel yev menka doktorin bir de hartsunek. Շատ շատ շնորհակալ ենք նորեն դոկտոր 
Turkey failed եւ այլն Turkey failed Թուրքիան ցախողեց ցախողեցավ այդ արդահայտության լավակույն օրինակներեն մշակութային արումով մեր այսօրվա հադուկ բյուրն է իմ սիրելի ընկերս բոլորին սիրելին հարուտ պամբուկճանը ինչպես բոլորս գիտենք հարուտ պամբուկճանը հայաստան զնած է եւ ճանցված է երասար տարիքեն իբր ցախ հարուտ սակայն 1975-ին սովետական հայաստանեն քաղտելով լիբանան մնացած է դարիմը որտեղ ես արիթ ունեցած ծանոթանալու եւ այդ ինքս մեն մեծ էր բայց շատ ավելի մտերի մեր բոլորի հետ ինչպես միշտ հիմայալ եւ անգամ ես միացյալ նահանգներ հաստատված է հարուտ պամբուկճանը հոմանիշն է թուրքիո ցախողության իր մշակույթով եւ իր երանթով դաղանթով եւ հայգական ոգիով ուրեմն հբարդ եմ որ արիթ ունենք հարուտին լսելու եթե կարելի է այս պահի միացնենք հարուտին Thank you, 
very much to our dear friend Harut Pamukchian for his special performance. And, you know, we will hear from him one more time. And, you know, with the goosebumps, I will, before I call the next speaker, as I listen to Dr. Hachik Muradian talk about Aleppo and the conditions, I thought of something and I pulled, I want to share it to put it in proper context. A quote from uh, Peter Balakian's great book, The Burning Tigress. Um, someone who was helping a German business name, man named August Bernot, who was one of the assistants to the Consul General in Aleppo, the United States, that was referenced by Dr. Muradian, Jesse Jackson. Uh, this is what he wrote. As on the gates of hell of Dante, the following should be written at the entrance of these accursed encampments. You who enter, leave all hopes. Feeling that what he had seen and heard surpasses all imagination. And he underscored, I thought I was passing through a part of hell. Everywhere it is the same governmental barbarism which aims at the systematic annihilation through starvation of the survivors of the Armenian nation in Turkey. Everywhere the same bestial inhumanity on the part of these executioners and the same tortures undergone by these victims all along the Euphrates from Meskene to Derzor. With that, uh, I will now call our third speaker, another good friend of our people and personally. Professor Dr. Yektan Türk Yilmaz received his PhD from Duke University Department of Cultural Anthropology. He taught courses at University of Cyprus, Sabanje, Bilgi, Duke, California State Universities, addressing the debates around the notions of collective violence, memory making and reconciliation and politics of music. He is working on his book manuscript based on his dissertation, Rethinking Genocide, Violence and Victimhood in Eastern Anatolia, 1913 to 1915, that addresses the conflict in Eastern Anatolia in the early 20th century and the memory politics around it. He has been 2014-15 EUME Fellow and returned as EUME Fellow for academic years 17, 18, 18, 19, and presently, that's the Europe and the Middle East. Studies in, he's based in Berlin and he is associated with the Freie University Berlin, Free University of Berlin, Friedrich Meinecke Institute. Um, Dr. Türk Yilmaz, welcome. And we would like to hear your perspectives as we sit today and looking back 105 years. Thank you very much, Edwin, uh, for your introduction. I would also uh, thank Organization of Istanbul Armenians for the invitation. It's a great honor for me uh, being with you, uh, commemorating the victims and survivors uh, of the genocide. Um, I'm going to, today I will be, I will try to um, uh, kind of look back to, to, to, uh, to, to the, to the to the to the days of genocide from our dire times today in the at the midst of uh, the, uh, the the the global uh, pa pandemic so uh, let me start with the genocide um, uh, i'm sure uh, all our uh, listeners already know about this uh, but just a uh, uh, general framework uh, the Armenian genocide is one of the most horrifying tragedies of the 20th century. Within a year, over a million Ottoman Armenians, amounting to more than 20% of the Armenian population in the world, was decimated by this Committee of Union and Progress government in the Ottoman Empire. On April 24, 1915, the government rounded up around 250 Armenian notables, intellectuals, clergymen, and political leaders in Istanbul. They were moved and incarcerated in central Anatolia. Only a handful survived. Finally, on May 29, 1915, the government passed the infamous 
temporary law of deportation, Tehcir Kanunu. The law made no explicit mention of Armenians, yet the target was apparent. The final destination for the forced deportees was Deresor, in what is today Eastern Syria by the Euphrates. Only Armenians from Istanbul, Izmir, and the areas of Russian occupation and a few other regions escaped the forced removals. Deportations were often accompanied by lootings, the killings of able-bodied adult men, and the abduction of children and young women. The massacres also included systematic extermination of almost all Armenian conscripts in the Ottoman army, uh, uh, army who had already been disarmed, by the way. Many refugees perished on the way due to harsh weather, continuous attacks, of, uh, attacks and starvations. Those who reached their Azor or other locations in uh, today's Syria had to deal with famine and contagious diseases, which took a further toll on the already traumatized survivors. The issues that um, Professor Khachik Muradian and, um, and, and, and, and Dr. Garb Garbis, uh, uh, Garbis Harboyan already addressed before me. So uh, by the end of 1916, thousands of years of Armenian presence in the Ottoman Eastern provinces, areas which many geographers and historians called historic Armenia or the Armenian Pl plateau was virtually extinguished. So, so what I've told you so far kind of explains or gives you a story of the Armenian genocide as, an, as, a, as, a, as a moment. Actually, catastrophes like genocides are not events. They are, or they are not moments. They are processes. They keep haunting both the, uh, uh, they keep haunting the victims and perpetrators alike. So my purpose today is around four or five points to see in what ways the specter of Armenian genocide lives with us even today. You know, first of all, under conditions, if a, a, a crime life genocide is not followed by justice uh, or is not, it's not followed by empowerment of the victims, we know, looking at many cases, is that what comes next is continued victimization of the victims. So um, uh, uh, uh, uh, Dr. Khachik Muradian gave the example of uh, Aleppo, the, uh, the deportees and survivors in Aleppo. Um, I would like to give you the example, again, from a similar area, uh, Armenians who used to live before the massacres, who used to live in the southern borders of today's Turkey, who later fled to, to, to, to, to Sanjak de Alexandretta, um, uh, hoping to create new lives and hoping to avoid perse further persecution. And these Armenians, amounting to almost 10,000, had to flee in 19. 2039, when the area was annexed by Turkey. So, and many of them fled either to Cyprus or to Lebanon. But victimization would follow those groups in the places where they went, hoping to put an end to, to, to the ongoing, uh, uh, ongoing victimization. I would like to remind once again that like many of these people were already uh, survivors or some of them were actually deportees. And, and, and many of like, you know, those who fled to, uh, to, Cyp to Cyprus had to once again uh, uh, uh, go through uh, that ordeal in 1974 when the clash, when the, the, the, the, the, the, the Turkish army invaded Cyprus. And likewise, uh, those others who went to Lebanon had to go through the, 
the, the, the, the had to um, survive another uh, calamity during the civil war. So, um, but more importantly, I think we also visit to see the effects of denial. So, uh, as of 1965, Turkish government started an aggressive and systematic policy of denial. What denial did is it did incise the wounds of the victims, survivors, or descendants of her survivors. So, um, uh, so it's kind of um, blocked any possibility of healing for the survive for for for the uh, survivors and descendants of victims of the Armenian genocide. And unfortunately, aggressive de denial, which still continues today. Continues to, uh, which still continues today, keeps the wounds of Armenians open. Um, so, uh, my first po first point is, Armenian genocide continue to live with the it, it's it's it's it's it's it's violent um, uh, implications continue to live with the survivors and the descendants of survivors. So. Armenian genocide, Armenian genocide was a process and um, um, implications of which still uh, looms on the, the, the, the, the victim groups. My second point is that it, the Armenian genocides are not only about destruction. They're also foundational and the moments of creation. You know, identities are formed out of uh, violence. Uh, state apparent uh, state uh, uh, uh, uh, statehoods are born out of uh, violence, and and uh, it wouldn't be say exaggeration that it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say say that Armenian genocide was a foundational moment for the Turkish state and Turkish nation and Turkish national identity, and. And, and, and more importantly, um, uh, the, the injustice the, uh, of genocide continue to, uh, to, to, to shape Turkish politics. Armenians were not the first to demand equal citizenship rights in Turkey or in the Ottoman Empire in those areas. And they are not the first to be punished, so to speak, for the crime of demanding equal citizenship rights. But even after the, the, the, the, the destruction of Armenian population, of the uh, Ottoman Armenian population, similar demands by other groups continued. Namely, if, you, if I were to like you to give a couple of like, you know, uh, names, by Kurds, by Alevis, and by other groups in Turkey. And so, uh, uh, uh, the memory of genocide, or the or the or the or the or the curse of the genocide, continued to haunt the the, the country and its politics up to today. And uh, a third point, a third, third observation about genocide, if we like, you know, put it put the genocide in the broader context of Middle East, the genocide was not only about the killing of Armenians. We know that uh, Assyrians, as well as Ezidis, were also the victims of the genocide. If we like, uh, take a broader perspective, broader perspective, broader trajectory, we see that Armenian genocide, ex post facto, we can deem it as a, we can locate it as a major moment in the process of de-Christianization of the Middle East. Uh, let me just give you one example. Um, by 1900, the Christian population of the Middle East, the entire broader Middle East area, was over 20%. And, uh, and until a couple of years ago, the estimates were below 5%. And if we look at the Armenian um, uh, the areas, especially that, that Armenians used to live, I think we would get even a, even a bigger uh, even more extreme figures here. So, um, and likewise, like Armenians, 
the other groups like Assyrians and Ezidis continue to continue to be uh, targets of, uh, uh, of of discrimination and persecutions at, at, at various occasions over time. Um, and my fourth point is that uh, that that Armenian genocide was also a watershed in this entire process of decristianization and also an important, I think, historical moment in the creation of the ongoing crisis, never ending crisis, which, uh, uh, which turned it into a total conflagration, especially since, uh, since uh, 2011, when the civil war in Syria began. And again, the curse of the genocide, this time, or the, or the, or, or, or the specter of genocide, showed it's the ugly face only a few years ago, uh, uh, in in Shengal against Ezidis. So it is a moment when you see that, like it's another moment when you see that if vulnerable groups are not empowered, what comes next is their uh, repeated repeat uh, victimization or repeat persecution. Um, my fifth point is um, is I mean I just want to like you know, now end with like you know with uh, with with with with uh, with some um, uh, ideas, looking at the moment of genocide or the process of genocide from the days of the the the the influenza, uh, for, uh, for the uh, the pandemic. Um, uh, uh, Doctor, uh, we can uh, Serfilian uh, mention the the use the term uh, resilience and. And and and and uh, uh, Mr. Garo Gazarian um, uh, uh, emphasized that that the perpetrators repeatedly emphasized that the perpetrators could not succeed in their aims, and uh, Dr. Khashik uh, Muradian uh, reminded us that that that genocide was not only about. Uh, the, the, the, the, the, the, the, the, the destruction of uh, Armenians and other groups by the perpetrators, but it was also a process of, of, of uh, resistance, uh, perseverance, and rebuilding the Armenian communities. If we think about uh, the, the, the, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I can, I can, I mean, I, I kind of see it as a moment of reality check for our civilization. In the sense that it is, over the past three decades, I think humanity is becoming increasingly concerned about the a new and approaching catastrophe that would likely influence, impact, have impact on entire humanity. That is true, that is the climate Crisis, so um, uh, so and and and and likewise, many genocide scholars or many scholars who do work on uh, on conflict point at likely uh, uh, uh, likelihood that that new forms of uh, genocide or new forms of uh, catastrophes uh, might uh, emerge. In the context of this, um, uh, this, this, this uh, new catastrophe, that climate change or climate crisis, that that that, that the humanity is facing, and I think uh, Armenian genocide teaches us, tells us, imp gives us import, teaches us important lessons about how to deal with crisis and how to uh, uh, how to survive a catastrophe. And and and and I just want to add that uh, uh, to the examples of of, of that Dr. Um, uh, Muradian gave. That is the examples of solidarity. I would also would like to to to to, to remember today uh, Armenians who resisted, especially in one, and managed to survive. So, if I look at Armenian genocide from today, I also see the hope that. Like, like like Armenian survivors did, 
uh, like many resistors did, that we can we can we can we can resist, we can um, uh, rebuild lives through sol uh, uh, with uh, by building solidarity, and we can so that we do not let the calamity take over us. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Turkilmaz. And I will now invite Dr. Sepilian, and we will get back to you on the thing to introduce our next speaker. Um, thank you, Edwin, for again involving um, this very, very distinguished panel, uh, you know, for this event. Our um, next speaker is Dr. Kim Hekimian. Dr. Hekimian is an assistant professor of nutrition and pediatrics and is on the faculty at the Institute of Human Nutrition at Columbia University. And she is associate director of the program in education in global and population health at Columbia Medical School. Uh, for many years, Dr. Hakimian has been very, very instrumental and been involved and has taught at the American University of Armenia School of Public Health and served at the, as the Associate Director of the Masters of Public Health Program and the Director of the Center for Health Services and Research in Armenia. Dr. Hakimian is a member of one of our uh, AMIX uh, affiliate organizations, APO, the Armenian American Healthcare Professional Organization in the tri-state area in New York. Um, and during this pandemic era, uh, APO has been extremely instrumental in disseminating accurate information from top level experts from the epicenter of the global epicenter of this COVID pandemic. Dr. Hakimian has been participating in giving updates on a weekly basis to participants from all over the world. Um, she also has been very active in uniting uh, various uh, non-governmental organizations uh, in the tri-state area in uh, collaborating and synchronizing their efforts towards uh, their activities in our homelands in Armenia focusing on capacity building um, rather than uh, charitable work. She truly has been a great role model for many of us, including myself. And it truly is my distinguished honor to uh, ask Dr. Hakimian to this uh, uh, podium on this platform. So Dr. Hakimian, um, please take over the screen and deliver your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vikan. Um, thank you to Edwin for organizing this event and for um, inviting me to speak. I want to clarify very um, assertively and briefly that I do not speak for um, the Armenian government, nor am I advising them. I just am an admirer of the work that they've done in the pandemic, and I'm happy to share those impressions with your audience. Um, and also, I am not on any front line. I'm working remotely from my home office as I am here today. Um, I have had the privilege of being able to work remotely um, since the um, start of the pandemic here in, in New York City. So I just wanted to clarify that. I, I decided to share a few slides with the audience because I think that they are illustrative of some of the impressions that I have. The, the theme of this talk today is, you know, the sort of the relationship between the pandemic and the genocide, commemorating the genocide and sort of the history of the First Republic and all of the challenges that the First Republic faced with everything going on geopolitically and also militarily, but this idea that there were um, infectious disease elements that ended up really um, if affecting all of the refugee population and their vulnerable in their vulnerable state is um, is something that I think history hasn't spent as much time on, and I'm glad to see that the 
speakers today were highlighting those issues. I <clears throat> Obviously, Armenia has changed significantly um, and the pandemic that we're facing today, um, they're, they're, there's a night and day difference in their capacity to handle it. And I would actually argue that Armenia is doing a phenomenal job with the leadership of the Ministry of Health and this um, um, their abilities to meet the needs of their population as best they can given their resources uh, for COVID-19. So if you'll allow me, I'm just gonna share a few slides to go through that. Um, so the first slide I wanna share with you <clears throat> is a slide that shows the new cases that are reported each day. And um, the first case was reported on March 1st. And this particular graph that I um, copied the link uh, for, it goes through April 24th. Um, but as of today, April 26th, there have been a total of 1,746 um, positive tests in, uh, in Armenia. What, is, what distinguishes Armenia um, versus many other countries. I, I should say here that the, the number of Bushvats cases here is 803, which means that of this 1,746, um, about half of them have already gone through their course of disease and have recovered. So they don't, they have um, you know, less than 800 active cases right now. I and mean, this is important because they continue to show daily how many cases they have positive and how many are released and recovered. They have had 28 deaths and um, most of those deaths have been in the older population. Um, the reason I wanna show this slide is because the transparency with which Armenia is transmitting their daily new cases has been very impressive and I think has gone a long way to engaging the population in trusting the information that they're seeing about the cases and where they are. This is another infographic that you can see. There are um, COVID-19 updates daily and a number of different sources in Armenia and in the Armenian language. So this is the one for today on April 26th. And if I talk about Armenia's COVID-19 capacity, I'd like to talk about this in terms of what we've been hearing on the news about what it means to have the public health capacity to manage the pandemic and what you need to sort of um, allow for the loosening of social distancing policies. So here I have um, testing, monitoring, quarantine, which is something unique in Armenia, um, hospital capacity and then public health communications capacity. Um, in terms of testing, Armenia is currently testing somewhere between 700 and 1200, 700 and 1200 uh, tests per day. They have the capacity to test about a thousand per day and they have not yet, um, their testing capacity is considered good for the infection rate in their country. And I'm gonna show you a slide on that in a second. Um, monitoring and quarantining is something that's done very differently in Armenia. And it is considered one of the strengths of the country's handling of the disease. So people who test positive are put into quarantine in hotels um, and all of their stay their hotel stay, their food, um, and all their medical care is covered by the government. So there is no COVID-19 expense that is out of pocket for the population. The quarantining allows the positive case and their immediate primary contacts to be monitored. And as soon as the need arises for hospitalization, that transfer happens. So between the hospitals and the quarantines, they have still enough capacity to meet the needs of those newly infected cases. The um, hospital capacity, they also have um, sufficient capacity. They built, they are 
excuse me, they're treating all of the COVID-19 patients at an infectious disease hospital in Yerevan. And then they built very quickly in the course of maybe 10 days, they built um, an additional um, number of units to be able to increase their capacity sufficiently. And they have not yet even gotten, they've not even used half of their capacity. So they have a lot of capacity still for hospitalization of COVID-19 patients. And then um, public health communication, I put one photo here. There is a number of public service announcements that have been um, created and disseminated throughout the population to talk about the best means for infection control and to um, engender the trust of the population that data is being transmitted in a transparent way. Um, again, trusting the health authorities that are in the lead is crucial to any strategy for infection control. And this um, effort is led by Arsene Torosian, who is the Minister of Health, but he also has a, a great team around him um, of people who have training in public health and who have um, the abilities to understand evidence-based uh, policymaking decisions. This photo on the right that I include is a photo from a video that talks about the restaurants that are involved in Armenia, the restaurants that are um, making the food for the people who are in the hotels who are um, COVID positive or have been, are the primary context for the people who are COVID positive. This is another example, I think, of really good risk communications. It is um, posted by the Minister of Health. This was a while ago. I think he has a new one, but this is as of April 17th. And he's using data to, I think he uses data well to communicate that though there are cases and new cases each day, and Armenia has not had a consistent 14 day decrease in their new cases, the rate at which the cases are doubling is at this point on April 17th was 17 days, which means that the acceleration of new cases has in fact slowed. And he uses data to convince the population that the social distancing policies or the stay at place policies have in fact had a huge benefit um, in slowing down the infection rate. Now, I just wanna switch to New York City for a moment and just show you that the way we also display data is similar. Um, these are New York City uh, COVID-19 cases on a, daily, um, on a daily count. But these the access for this graph is in the thousands. So whereas Armenia's highest number of new cases it was one day, I think they had 91 cases, 92. This is a graph that shows that you know, we have had new cases well above 6,000 in a given day in New York. So the situation in New York is so much more severe and there's really a lot of good journalism writing about some of the reasons why that might be the case, but New York City is the epicenter of the United States and the Armenian community in New York and New Jersey has felt its toll, not only in terms of being sick, but also in terms of the economic fallout and in terms of the community um, engagement needed to try to meet the needs of our own vulnerable people here in New York and New Jersey. So there has been over the last few weeks, a lot of community-based activity to try to meet the needs of those people. So as of today in New York, we have 153,204 positive cases. This is just New York City um, and um, an estimated uh, number of deaths, 16,673. Um, this is the death, this combines two numbers, deaths that are um, confirmed COVID positive and then deaths that are probable um, related to COVID-19. I put this graph up, um, I had done a webinar last week and I put this graph up. This is um, all cause mortality in New York City as of um, April 4th. And the reason I wanted to put this there is just because graphically it shows you on the, um, on the vertical axis, you have like the number of deaths per month in New York City, typical deaths, where there was a spike in September of 2000. Um, one as a result of September 11 uh, and the uh, what happened at the World Trade Center. 
But generally speaking, you see this pattern of deaths per month in New York City. And then on April 4th, by April 4th, you see this skyrocketing of deaths. And I put it there to show that um, this is not an overreaction or an overreporting of cases. In our community here in New York and New Jersey, being in the eye of the storm, so to speak, has really affected the community um, overall. And it's, it's the um, dramatic increase in cases in a very short period of time really did have the community as a whole here in New York um, transition to a lot of their community activities and community support. And I think this is one of my last um, slides. I'm showing you here that uh, New York and New Jersey, this was as of April 6th, so these numbers have changed. But as of April 6th, um, these were the cases um, in New York and New Jersey where we have um, you know, a, a very large Armenian diaspora and community I'm speaking to you from my home in New Jersey. Um, and I just wanted to compare this to California because I know most of you are um, watching this in California and just to compare the two graphs to show you the um, immense number of cases that we have here in New York and why our um, why our situation is different in terms of the way that we feel vulnerable to this disease. And so again, I just wanted to give you the same update about New York total cases, total hospitalizations and total death. And you can see, I mean, that we've had 40,000 hospitalized with COVID-19 and the hospital capacity almost reached full capacity, but we were lucky that it did not. Um, we have now a decreasing rate of hospitalization and a decreasing rate of new cases. So um, that is one of the indicators for loosening this social distancing um, policies. But if I were to talk about the kind of capacity for those areas I showed you in Armenia, our testing capacity is not sufficient to be able to monitor whether we're having a second surge in the way that we want to. Our hospital capacity is okay, but if we have another surge, we need to again re, uh, reallocate our hospital services to make room, so to speak, for the COVID-19 patients. Our abilities to monitor and quarantine, we don't, of course, put new positive cases into a hotel. We don't, as a US government, pay for the COVID-19 related expenses for our population here. And we um, don't have the abilities to do the kind of uh, contact tracing that Armenia is doing on a daily basis. So in many ways, um, and, and this is testament to the leadership of this issue in Armenia, um, in many ways, the, the, the key indicators for uh, public health surveillance of the COVID-19 outcome is actually better in Armenia than it is here locally. So um, this is my last slide. I um, thank you for your time and that I know it's gone on longer than um, originally planned, but I appreciate if any of you have questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. But I, I say again that I'm not, I'm not an expert at all. I don't speak for the Armenian government. I'm just a, an admirer of what they're doing. And, um, and I'm happy to discuss some of the activities that the local community has done here. I know that in LA, there is a lot of community activism to meet the needs of the vulnerable population there as well. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hakimian, for that really uh, informative uh, update on um, what's happening really in, in Armenia and, and what's become the epicenter of the you know, global pandemic in Armenia. Edwin? Oh, thank you. I just came on. I believe, uh, no, no, I defer to you and then to Garo for our break before we go to the uh, panel discussion and the questions. So, well, before... uh, doctor, uh, Dr. Sepili, uh, uh, are we going to hear uh, connect with Harut one more time? Yes, uh, yes. So we, we will go ahead and uh, share that. There you go. <laughs> Thank you.
Are you ready? Yeah, we can. Are we ready? Yeah, if we can ask every all of our panelists to turn on uh, their video, and we have um, some questions. Uh, we would like to encourage everybody to uh, submit your questions in the Q and A section. You may do so in English or in Armenian. Um, we have a question from Vahe Hayrikian, um, and. He asks, um, any practical work towards demanding Western Armenian territories? If not, what and who will carry this task in the near future? Well, uh, uh, in order for anybody to ask for territories, uh, the word anybody has to be taken out of the equation because only sovereign nations can ask for territories. That is my understanding from the tutorials I've received from uh, uh, our uh, mutual friend Karnik Kirkonian, who's an international law expert, and that would be Republic of Armenia uh, that could ask for territories. Uh, Khachig uh, has done a lot of work uh, in terms of historical uh, data as to uh, territories, territories seized during the war uh, versus occupied territories where the Palestinians and the Israeli government are in ongoing dispute with, but I don't think individuals can ask for territories returned. They can ask for, uh, you know, property, uh, personal property, but not territorial claims. Edwin, uh, Hachik, anything you want to add? No, to I defer to Dr. Yeah, Hachik Muradian or Yektan Turkilmas if they have anything to say in response to that question. Yes, uh, Edwin, uh, Garo, you both have uh, 
more experience participating in discussions on, uh, on this. I just wanted to mention a couple of quick things. One is that in terms of different entities that have been involved in uh, a variety uh, outside of the Armenian state, of course, uh, of, of, of other ways of demanding reparations uh, for the Armenian genocide and its consequences. It's worth noting that uh, there's the Armenian Legal Center, Armenian Catholic Crusade, there are individual lawyers and initiatives uh, over uh, many years. I know Garo, even recently you have been involved, you mentioned Carning as well. Uh, so there, are, there have been creative ways of pushing as far as individuals and organizations are concerned in, in that direction. I also wanna just quickly mention that uh, August 10th of this year marks the 20th, uh, the 100th anniversary of the uh, Sever Treaty. And I believe there were going to be a number of initiatives in that regard. I'm not sure how the current situation is going to be affecting that. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have a question from Dr. Nazili Daphne Sahar Yildizi, Doctor of Public Health from Loma Linda University, Department of Public Health Promotion and Education. And she asks, where is Armenia today in terms of globalization medically and politically? If Armenia may be looking forward to globalization for the sake of economic development, is Armenia ready to face the consequences of globalization? Armenia, as we know it, is a jewel with regards to natural sources, the most important ones being water and agriculture. Is Armenia ready to protect its culture and resources um, and medical system without introducing foreign vaccination rules and genetically modified agricultural practices imposing certain health threats, which are uh, debatable among scientific communities, specifically pertaining to the inconsistency the WHO has displayed over the years. I think perhaps Dr. Hakimian, I'll ask you to take a, to take a stab at this one. I think that Thank I'm you, Vikan. Thanks for yeah passing that. Well, I mean, thanks for the the question. It's a very very broad question. I'm not going to be able to answer that. And again, you know, just to remind the audience and and the I, I don't I don't at all speak for the Armenian government. I think that um, that we all know and understand that tourism is one of Armenia's largest economic drivers, and that Armenia has participated in the movement of globalization and that movement of globalization has been uh, positive for Armenia's economy and other areas of growth. With globalization comes these kinds of vulnerabilities and risks for things like the coronavirus. Um, I can't speak to the areas of agriculture and, and vaccines and things of that nature. What I can say is that as the evidence grows stronger about the best ways to manage the infection and control the transmission of the infection, and at the same time, safely open up the economy, Armenia will be moving in that direction and hopes to quickly, at the safest time possible, reopen the avenues of travel and, um, and tourism and, and other, other businesses that require um, the loosening of social distance policies. Yes, thank you, Dr. Akiman. And I think that you know we can all um, anticipate those types of needs and, and prepare ourselves and perhaps be proactive in doing our part in um, engaging in some of these activities that will be crucial for um, the economic, um, uh, economic situation in Armenia, which as Dr. Hakimian said, you know, relies heavily on tourism. Um, if I could make a plug before you move on, and I would like to make this plug to the audience. Um, you know, the desperate situation of the First Republic and post-genocide was purely in the area of humanitarian assistance. And Today, we do have a need for humanitarian assistance, but we've learned over the years that the best assistance for Armenia is assistance that helps 
strengthen the systems there. So for health system strengthening, I think very often the diaspora has not, has not invested in things like surveillance mechanisms or medical education training or other areas that we could utilize now to uh, prepare ourselves for the, for the second surge, which is most likely going to happen and to prepare Armenia for the next pandemic. So I would just like to make that plug um, to see if we could do things a little bit differently this time around. Thank you, Dr. Ekimian. Um, um, I'd like to invite my colleague Garo to take on a few comments that have come in in Armenian in the Q&A section. Uh, Garo, if you can. Uh... See where they are. Uh, actually, uh, well, one comment is a is a is a, uh, a comment expressing gratitude for all the participants from Seta Mangasarian. Another one is. Uh, Another comment of gratitude for uh, organization of Istanbul Armenians uh, for um, uh, continued efforts and uh, programming such as this. Uh, I don't see any other comments in Armenian unless, unless I'm missing something, but I'll take this opportunity to, uh, to ask um, a question that had come up when Dr. Harboyan was speaking uh, Dr. Harboyan uh, mentioned about Dr. Hamdi Suad, uh, who uh, was doing live experiments uh, with typhoid injected blood uh, into uh, Armenian soldiers, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then uh, Dr. Tugasikvor, I answer, Iranunov Tankaran Mehim Nazen Istanbul Imet, Yev Gabadven Iren Iper Himnatire Inchi. I'd make a chance to say, Iranunov, Iranunov, I saw Tankaram Koytuni in Bolso Mech. I think Zinc Bad Badzen, I saw Nerga Ishanutuna, Bad Badzen, Zinc, Tankarani Maanuna, Iranum Voroshadze. Okay. I think Kanadak when Iran. I will translate that, please. For okay, so so so the so you heard the first part of what, what I was referring to. The doctors in his presentation spoke about Dr. Hamdi Saud or Suad, who was doing live experiments on uh, an Armenian soldiers. I, I I presume in the Ottoman army that were in part of the Ottoman army conscripts, uh, and he said that today uh, there is a museum that is named after him in uh, in uh, in Bolis. Uh, the, the Dr. Hamdi Suad. So that's what I wanted to know. So this person that was doing what I would view as inhumane uh, treatments, perhaps, not perhaps, rather uh, categorically opposed to the hypocritical oath of a physician, uh, there's a museum named after him apparently. Yeah, Yektan, uh, is there anything you could add on that? I'm not sure if you, I'm sure you know a lot and I know you about this. I'm just what, <laughs> yeah, I mean, more? Is, is, is, interestingly, um, thank you very much for this really amazing um, uh, presentation on uh, Mr. Harbour and on the epidemics during the genocide and experiments on Armenians. By the uh, way, Yektan speaks fluent Armenian, understands okay, it. Thank you. So, um, uh, as far as what I know, he's he's he's he's one of the one of very prominent figures in Turkish medical history, and he is one of the names who uh, who's even started to study uh, the research on um, cancer. Uh, I mean, you know, to to sum it up, I mean, he is not any medical person. He is a very important, very. Uh, very respected, so to speak, uh, figure, important, prominent figure in the history of uh, medicine in Turkey. Uh, was he tried in 1919 or no? Was he, was he? No, no, I don't, I don't, I no, don't no, think he has so. Not been. I don't think no, so. No, he's not been, huh? Okay. I don't oh. think so. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Sepilian, uh, we'll return back to you. Yeah, so there, there's a question from uh, Shahan Avedyan, and the question is, um, how is the response uh, for COVID-19 in Armenia in comparison to its neighbors? Hi, um, I suppose you want me to answer that question. So the, 
Um, I mean, there are um, a, the interaction between the Ministry of Health of Armenia and the Ministry of Health in Georgia has been um, ongoing and consistent from the very beginning of the pandemic to coordinate uh, border crossings and testing for border crossings. The, uh, uh, Georgia has reported fewer cases than in Armenia. Um, importantly, Armenia made a decision very early on uh, when they had their first, uh, when Iran had their first cluster of cases, Armenia made a decision that though they closed their borders, they gave the right of every Armenian citizen to return. And so when Armenian citizens returned, there were uh, cases among those um, who traveled in from other countries, and that may account for some of the differential in cases. Um, Azerbaijan is reporting about the same number of cases as Armenia, but again, uh, I don't know anything about how testing and monitoring is going on there. And um, Dr. Hakimian, there's a follow-up question. Um, and the question is um, regarding the deaths, the number of deaths that have been reported. Are they mostly in Yerevan? So uh, the deaths are mostly in Yerevan as the cases are mostly in Yerevan, but at this point there are cases in every one of the Mars, uh, every one of the provinces in, in Armenia. And I forgot to mention that there are nine confirmed cases in Artsakh as well. And all of the provinces and Artsakh are um, following the social distancing. No, they have governance um, to support social distancing or physical distancing policies. Um, this is hard to carry out um, in many aspects of society there. And um, it really relies on people's vigilance and human behavior in order to slow the transmission in these areas, but mostly in Yerevan, yes. Right. Dr. Sipilia, may I ask a question? Of course. Yeah, uh, because switching, I want to address this to Dr. Ajik Muradian and also derivatively as a second uh, follow-up if need be to Dr. Yekdan Turkilmaz. Uh, Dr. Muradian, you did talk about, of course, the disease you did reference the causation issue. And I'm gonna um, be specific because in a lot of denialist you know, uh, theories and propaganda, what we usually hear is that, well, Armenians were transported for security reasons, the deaths were related to World War I and mostly perhaps to diseases that happened that was beyond our control. In other words, diseases disconnected from the cause effect relationship of the genocide. And that's one of the primary themes of, or the tenets of the denialist argument. Um, could you please address that and rebut it for us? Uh, yes, yeah, so it is indeed one of the central arguments, as you say. Uh, a couple of things here. The first is that uh, not, there's two components to it. The first is the fact that, you know, unlike, uh, a bulk of the population of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, of course, there are many uh, groups that were, there was a lot of population uh, movement, displacement, uh, other communities were severely affected, but uh, there's a distinction that needs to be made between people suffering the consequences of the war, whether it's disease, starvation, uh, et cetera, in, their, uh, in an environment that they're familiar with, as opposed to people being marched under harsh conditions, uh, massacres, uh, you know, uh, starvation, uh, being exposed to the, to the elements and being exposed to disease in those kinds of conditions. Not to mention the fact that, you know, finding uh, themselves in extremely hostile environments uh, like the Syrian desert or in areas where they don't speak the language. It's worth noting that we're talking about Syria. Uh, many of these uh, Armenians who are arriving here do not speak Arabic, right? So, so all of these elements uh, are important. That's one component. The second component has to do with uh, essentially uh, weaponizing uh, intentionally uh, the disease in order to continue the decimation of the Armenian population. And this is also an, an important element. So uh, the Ottoman authorities were not simply, you know, letting the Armenians die. They, they were in fact uh, pushing the Armenian population into areas, concentrating them in these, in these camps that would become repositories of just death and, uh, and, and the spread of the disease. I gave the example of Meskana, 
Uh, you read a, a quote from Bernal about you know comparing you know mass to, to hell. It is it is that kind of environment, and it's worth uh, thinking about in both uh, regards. So not just in terms of uh, there being a central uh, uh, centrally coordinated plan of destruction through massacre, but also you know whenever these opportunities are arising, you see a weaponization of disease as well. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, no. yeah, I think this is a very this is a great question. Uh, and uh, um, I would like to again, once again, uh, quote uh, Dr. Harboyan. Uh, uh, when we talk about epidemics, uh, contagious diseases, it was not only Armenians for sure. And there was a widespread uh, uh, uh, contagious diseases also within the army. Uh, I know the case of Erzurum, you know, uh, by December 1914, you know, daily hundreds of uh, soldiers were dying. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then uh, also that like, you know, but we, if you look at like, you know, figures, not only, uh, but before that, let me put this, let me say this, you know, um, both like, if you look at like, you know, why these happen, I mean, it's not that like, you know, diseases are not just biological events. They are very social and they have like a serious social and political dimensions. So not everyone is equally vulnerable to disease or, or pandemic. So what the government did is like, you know, its decisions made certain groups everyone is more vulnerable to epidemics or contagious diseases. Um, I mean, it's their decision to be in the war without much preparation, of course, like, you know, uh, created this uh, a catastrophic situation for the army and their decision, decision to exterminate Armenians, to force them out of their uh, homes, make them vulnerable. I mean, uh, uh, Hachik's uh, work is a great example. I would also want to cite Vahe um, uh, Tashchian's work, for example, like, you know, where he shows that, I mean, there is contagious diseases, but not every community uh, suffers the same amount. You see that Armenians suffer definitely more than other groups, like, you know, for example, Arabs already living in those areas. So these all, like, you know, tells us that, like, you know, these are not natural processes. These are all have to do with uh, uh, political choices, decisions made by uh, the, the, the, the governments and their consequences. Thank you very much there. Um, so we have some questions that are coming in from Facebook and we have a question from uh, Barit Maronyan for Dr. Hekimian. Um, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the effective efforts of the following countries and their efforts on fighting COVID-19? Armenia as compared to Turkey, as compared to the USA. Uh, thank you, Barit. I'm I'm not in a position to expertly answer that question. Um, what I can say is that I can. What I can say about Armenia in terms of answering that question is the um, the types of communication and public health communication and messaging that came out from Armenia from their very first case, which they learned about on I think February 29th, March 1st, is uh, it's. It's a huge contrast to the type of public health risk communication that came out um, from the federal governments of the United States and from uh, Turkey. So I, I can't give a, a rating or a scale. What I can say is that future historians who are interested in this issue will be writing the history books, looking at the kinds of decisions that were made um, along a timeline, a temporal timeline from when we first knew about this new disease. And I think that um, they will help us clarify when these history books are written, uh, which countries took better governance early on. And I would hope that Armenia would do well in that comparison of those three countries. Indeed, yes. Thank you, Dr. Hakimian. And thank you, Barit, for your uh, question. Um, we do have a question from, um, Salpia Karagian to Dr. Harboyan. Um, 
And her question is, where can we read more about the diseases that the Armenian genocide survivors faced? Uh, there are many references, many books. Uh, for example, I have, uh, uh, there is a Melanie Schultz Danielian. Uh, in her 2014 article, which is, I'm quoting, Diseases and Health, Public Health, Ottoman Empire, Middle East. This is the name of the, his study, her study. And uh, in, his, uh, in her uh, writing, he quotes and says, there are at entrance of a heap of dead bodies laid unburied in the immediate neighborhood of the rain tents of those who were down with virulent dysentery. The, the filth in and around these tents was something indescribable. On one single day, the burial committee buried as many as 580 bodies. And she goes on a lot of statistics as and this is a very, very good reference. Thank you. The name, of course, the author is Melanie Schultz Daniel Jan. Um, I just want to jump in in case, you know, I may be wrong, but uh, you may be too humble to, to say it. But Dr. Harboyan, I believe you've written books about that topic. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I published a book uh, just a year ago uh, about the Armenian doctors who were. Uh, involved in diseases. And this is the book uh, is Armenian. It's titled Odyssey of the Armenian doctors, pharmacists, and uh, uh, dentists in, during the Armenian genocide. I uh, found in all Ottoman Empire around 497 Armenian doctors among those 497 doctors, 316 were killed by the Turkish uh, and during the uh, genocide. 79 doctors had the typhus and or the typhoid, and they died because of the typhus or the typhoid. And uh, 97 doctors were escaped, and they left the country and they went all over the world, scattered, as we see, as we know. Uh, so 16% of those doctors were dead because of the uh, typhus or the typhoid. So now I imagine if 16% of the doctors were dead because of the typhus or the typhoid, and those doctors were working in the hospitals, imagine if we say that during the, the uh, genocide, there were in the Ottoman Empire, two million Armenians. What would be the percentage of the people who died from the uh, typhus, typhoid, malaria, or all other uh, diseases? Uh, most probably there were more than 300 or 400,000 uh, Armenians killed from the, those diseases. Uh, I want to, if you permit me, to mention a few uh, references or uh, quotations because of the uh, pandemics during the genocide. Uh, the Harry Morgantown, the American Amerigazi uh, Tespana, uh, I have written in Armenian, so I will tell in Armenian. Charti Orerun, this is a quotation from um, Harry Morgantown. Charti Orerun, Bosome Chaydararaze, Inc. Sova Anotutunu Cherazergumu Yevaragi, Chamara Jarak, Ivan Tutunere, Gdira Bedin, Ampoch, Osmanian, Bedutian Mech. Yemasnavarobes, Haigagan, Kartagayan Neru Mech. Jean Dachte, Typhoide, Hamadarazer, Ampoch, Osmanian, Bedutian Mech. Nansen, Gese Hazaravor Manukne, Mahatsan, Anotutene, Zarave, Yavaragi, Chivantutunere, Amposh, Tarakutan and Tatskin. 
Armen Wegner, Manukner, Lalov, the Chalov, the Merein, Anno Tutene, Zarabute, Ye, Varagi Chivan to Tunere, Maria Jacobson, Hazarabor, Hai Manukner, Mahasan, Chicago Utene, Anno Tutene, Ye Zanazan de Sagi, Hamajarak Nere, Simon Baratian, Ye Alexander Hadisian, Kasazin, Hazarina das Nutin, Amarva Yev Ashnan Yeganak Nerun, Hayastan Yen Targavaze Kolera I Hamajaragin. Garavarutun Amen Michotsi Manze by Karelo Amar Asamajarak Nerun, Sagan Sahoazin. Yev Samaran Yeganagin, Typhusa, Typhusi Hamajaraga, and Taratazze, and Pochayastani Mech. Or Hladze Hazarabor Hayeru Yank. Azarina das Ini Arachin Chors Amis Nerun, Mestiv of Hayer, Mahatazen. Modavora be Jogurtin, Dastavets, Arharur. Taifusi Amajaraga, Gadbazer Aitoirun, Gadarial Aretma. Kolerai, Yev Taifusi Amajarak Neru, Himnagan, Bachan Gadbaze, Hai Kartagan Nerun, Tivom, Mestivo, Udagumo Ampo Chayastani Mitch. Yev Semte Taifuse Anshust Mahatan, Aitoirun. Aram Manukiana, Yevrostom, Yeruknal, Typhus Barak Besan, Yevuknal, Mahasan, Ait Bacharov. Thank you, Dr. Arboyan. Uh, we have a question. Um, it's coming from Montreal from Zavin uh, Zakarian. Question to Dr. Turkil Maz. The Armenian genocide issue puts Armenians and Turks on opposite, um, opposite sides of the debate. For many Armenians, this is a personal and moral issue seeking justice. However, the justice part of the Armenians also implies the inclusion of the return of lost land and property. For Turks, this is an issue of land loss and potentially very dangerous for Turkey. You as a Turkish historian, how do you see this two conflicting parties approach and resolve this subject? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I, let me begin like um, uh, with a disclaimer, disclaimer like uh, Dr. Hekimian. I'm not in a position to talk on behalf of Turks or Turkish state, Turkish government, any Turkish party involved in this uh, conflict. But yes, actually uh, it is a uh, uh, we are at a point uh, that that that that uh, that Turkey is way away from uh, any um, any any point of uh, reconciliation, retribution, redress. I mean, these are I think unfortunately we are very away from that point. Um, but we, uh, we, we, I mean, and and a question of like you know justice. I keep using the term justice, but. By justice, I mean empowerment of the, the, the, the, the, the victim group and their normalization, or they, they are becoming unmarked to the level, I mean, just uh, empowerment, their empowerment, at least to the point that a vanity Armenian walks in the streets of one as an unmarked person. Uh, this is, I think, uh, what, you know, but otherwise, justice after genocide, a perfect justice. I mean, what kind of justice can you expect? You know, I mean, first of all, an ideal justice is not even possible. Um, regarding uh, the, uh, the, the, the, the, the other parts, of course, I totally agree that, that, that especially the properties, abandoned, you know, the properties seized by authorities uh, uh, should be should definitely be, be to to return to their their real uh, uh, legitimate uh, legal owners and their descendants. I think um, uh, Edwin. Uh, I mean, uh, there have been several cases, uh, though unsuccessful. But I think beyond and above all, uh, we what we desperately need at this point not only for the Armenian victims, victims, but also like, you know, I try to mention, refer to like, you know, to, to, to, to, to, to I want to point, I, I try to point out that, I mean, the, the, the kind of conflict or the, the, the, the, the catastrophe we are talking about today 
is not a history in the region. I mean, Turkey has a big Kurdish problem. Turkey is, is, is, is again, once again, in very, let's say, adventurous policies abroad. So what we need for justice, but also to prevent further um, catastrophes happening in the, in, the, in, the, in the country and in the area is an immediate recognition of genocide before all. I think that would be the first and most important step, if that's by any means a question, answer to your question. Uh, thank you. Sure. Uh, it's okay. Yes, go ahead, Edwin. I think just was going to just say, okay, follow up on this justice thing, and I'll return to you, Dr. Sipilian, for like one final question, and then we can wrap up our conference. But what I heard from Dr. Turkilmaz and Agaro may join on this as well, just as someone who's worked on trying to get justice, at least through courts. Uh, we know how important it is that there is a governmental level recognition sure. that it was a legal act of genocide. And having two thirds of the United States government now on board, because until then we haven't, and the courts have said, federal courts in the United States said, well, the United States government doesn't speak and doesn't find genocide. We as courts cannot make that legal finding. And that's very important. I, we don't have time for that, but like genocide, for example, would not have any statute of limitations. So there's a lot of justice that can be pursued, not subject to the time limitations. And now the United States Senate and the House having passed resolutions almost unanimously is very critical on this progress. Future cases may have a different you know, venture. And of course, the important one is the executive branch and one day we will get it. So anyone who thinks the recognition is just a vain effort and it's not going anywhere, it is legally significant. That's all I have to say. And if Garo wants to say anything, then we'll go back to Dr. Recipient. It, it is legally significant. I don't know if, is my microphone off? Yeah, it is You're significant. And, and, and I dare say that um, the courts uh, uh, have not had the fortitude to do what's right. It's not that uh, because our government hasn't decided. They've turned this whole issue into a political question. And as a result of that, punted it as though it's a, it's a politics versus uh, history. Um, uh, history, uh, they say, is written by victors. Well, we won, okay? We are still here, and we're going to write that last chapter of history one way or another. Uh, I'm confident of that. I am very confident that we're going to write that last chapter. That's all I'll say. Dr. Sipilian, one last question, please. We have one last question here. So that uh, we have seen photos of Armenian survivors and refugees lining the square or Harabarag in Yerevan in the immediate post-genocide period and at the time of the establishment of the First Republic. Could one of the panelists comment about the typhoid and other contagious, contagious disease prevailing among the population in the First Republic uh, on the heels of the genocide and what may be known about the nature of the Armenian government's response and impact in combating the disease during those times? Uh, may I yes. comment? Yes. Uh, during those days, of course, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there were thousands and thousands uh, of catastrophes among them was one of the uh, pandemic of typhus and typhoid and other diseases. So the government was unready to take care of all those patients. It was the first few months of independence. So they could not manage and the result was the death of thousands, more than 2,000, 200,000 deaths were mentioned in only in Yerevan or around Yerevan. So the government was not ready at that time to take care. It was the first few months of independence. So there was no possibility to take care all of those possible. The hospitals were not ready. 
Uh, may I please jump in and add a couple of uh, words there? Um, even before the the the uh, the, the the first republic, uh, there were um, refugees, especially Vanetsi refugees, refugees from one. Uh, who, uh, as as as as uh, as you know, uh, Vanetsi by and large, a good part of Vanetsi could so, could survive because of the resistance, but many of them perished on the way, and and and especially. In, in, in, in today's Armenia. Uh, and um, as far as what I read in historical records, uh, they did not, I mean, and those were like, you know, the, the days of war uh, and they could, they did not receive much, uh, uh, much help uh, because of General, limited. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. But um, but you know uh, it is also one. Also, we don't, we should also emphasize that like you know that destruction. I mean, we said that repeatedly. But you know, destruction uh, of a population. I mean, it's not just killing. As like you know, Khachik uh, um, uh, gave amazing examples from like you know how um, epidemic can be weaponized, and also like you know we should also look at you know. Think about like you know the the the the, the methods of destruction uh, that that were used during during or that came out during the, the the massacres and after the massacres. One invisible one is the like you know the the destruction of Vanetsi, not even in, within the Ottoman territories. They were forced out of Ottoman territories. They had to fled to Armenia, and they either were they died. Many of them died on the way because of the attacks because they were made vulnerable, and eventually. Even bigger numbers perished in Echmiadzin and in Yerevan. Uh, may I add something else? Uh, uh, as uh, he was mentioning, uh, the main problem at that time also was because of uh, the uh, refugees, uh, more than uh, 100,000 of refugees yes. were in Yerevan uh, yes. coming from the o Ottoman Empire. Uh, yes. For example, Tatul Hagopian mentions in his one of the, his articles, he says, between 1918 and 1919, during winter season, 180,000 Armenians died because of the uh, typhus, typhoid, or other diseases. And he says the, the, the situation was very, very bad uh, concerning the health. Majority of those who died, he says here, Daily, they had 2,000 deaths. Daily, they had 2,000 deaths because of the typhus or the typhoid. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Arboy, and thank you, uh, Yektan, for that. If anyone has any closing remarks, or Dr. Sefilian, if you have one very you know, good question, if not, I will close. But if anybody has anything final to say, please. Um, I just wanted to, there was a comment on the chat from a woman who said that her aunt died of an infectious disease. And I, I, I think all of us here have stories about our ancestors, um, some of who um, survived, but members of their family died of infectious diseases. And I think that that's an important thing to consider, you know, moving forward. Uh, my own um, grandfather and his mother um, walked from the Harpert area to Alexandropol where they were separated. My um, grandfather was put into an orphanage and his mom was um, in separate housing and um, she died of typhoid and he lived. Um, there were outbreaks of cholera in that area as well. I'm sure that the orphanages played a role in infection control, maybe in nutrition and things like that that are important for um, improving outcomes from infectious disease. But the um, the woman in the chat wanted us to, you know, to read that comment and to um, have us all remember that um, many of our own family members had uh, succumbed to some of the issues in the in the pandemic during those those years. Well, we will try uh, right, Vikan or Garo. 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Hekimian, um, and all the other uh, outstanding speakers, and thank you for the uh, organizers as well, uh, Edwin and uh, OI, OAI for um, um, or OIA. I'm sorry for for this, you know, uh, really informative session. Uh, my take-home message again: this is continuation of being resilient. This is another chapter of us being resilient. Um, you know, these types of hard times bring us together. We connect in, uh, in more uh, special ways. And this is just an example. We probably could not have planned such a thing on a Sunday uh, several months ago with the same attendance, with the same outstanding attendance. And the attendees have remained engaged. Thank you. And thank you, Edwin, for your leadership. And my dear colleague, Garo, uh, who's been a champion for many Armenian uh, causes and issues. Thank you, Garo. It's really an honor to be on a, such a distinguished panel and amongst such uh, you know, distinguished speakers. Thank you, please be safe and stay healthy. Um, uh, Dr. Sepilian, um, merci Viken. Uh, that word that you um, repeated throughout today Resilience, um, yeah, we are resilient people. We especially Armenians are resilient people because I can just recite real quickly, 1896, Hamidian massacres, 1909, Adana chart, 1915, obviously the genocide. Uh, go forward into uh, what the uh, Bolsahai community endured in the 50s and 60s that uh, Edwin has shared with me over the years. Uh, the Armenians, uh, not rather the Armenian, the Lebanese civil war of the 70s, the Syrian conflict, the Iranian revolution, um, post-Soviet uh, Armenian uh, migration outside of Armenia, and all the way to the Artsakh resistance movement. Uh, we are here. So when people tell us, uh, stay at home and be safe, Dana Manatsek, Duna Mana, and we hear some youngsters in our communities, you know, frustrated. Um, all we need to do is look back and uh, as Armenians, and of course, as civilization uh, and um, heed the wise counsel of those who have uh, the information necessary, reflect and hear uh, doctors like Dr. Uh, Dr. Hakimian and uh, medical Dr. Harboyan uh, uh, and Yektan and uh, Professor and Dr. Khachik uh, Muradian, uh, and you, uh, my dear Viken, um, and and we will be fine. We will we will we will be fine because we are resilient. We've always been resilient, and we will be victorious at the other end of this crisis. Thank you all for having me. Thank you for the organization of Istanbul Armenians, and a special thank you to Hasmik, who's behind the scenes, that, having done a lot of work. Hasmik Kedibarian, Varskat Kadar, and thank you. Uh, Akhparik, Edwin, I pass, I pass the baton on to you. Oh, thank you. So thank you, Garo. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sepilian, for helping me to put this together uh, before yeah, we close. But of course, we, uh, I would like to say, we, as we remember, uh, those who, the one and a half million victims, and as though the faith will have it, as the church has declared them to be saints, our saints and we respectfully bow our heads today. And of course we pledge to continue to be eternally resilient, eternally demanding and eternally educating in their memory and for the future and for all nations who are you know, on the same boat as we are today in this pandemic. We see how the globe is connected, how genocide or a pandemic can hit anywhere strike any group, any ethnic, religious uh, group anywhere in the world. And that's our duty as Armenians, I believe, to ensure that it doesn't happen. Um, we are, we have Dr. Harboyan from Montreal, Canada. We have Dr. Yektan Turkilmaz from Berlin, Germany, Dr. Muradian and Dr. Hekimian in New York City. And as you guys said, we are in California and strange consequence of the pandemic, we are able to all be on the same screen instead of being in a hall. 
and having to take, you know, air flights to get here. Uh, it's, it's a strange world. And hopefully we'll, you know, we'll have a mix of this, but I think this will stay because we were able to reach a lot of people. And thank you again. We are honored to have you. Thank you for your generosity of knowledge and time. And I also want to take the thank uh, Armenian American Medical Society, uh, Dr. Vikan Sefilian and Hasmi Kerevarian for all their help for the logistic support that it could not have been possible without their assistance. Uh, I want to thank my uh, board as well for or any all the supporters of OIA so we can put together these kinds of events. And I thank everyone. I believe Dr. Sefilian will leave the I will leave the screen, but we'll play the remember by uh, composer Ara Gevorgian. It's an amazing piece from the 100th anniversary of the commemorative events of the genocide. So again, I'm grateful to your help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Everyone. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you. 